playground with the kids. Normal was deciding between a booth or a table. But now, Normal looks new. New ways to spend our time. New ways we interact with each other. New ways we experience God. Normal changed. Will you? In week two of a series entitled A New Normal. And I don't know anyone who likes that phrase. <laughs> In fact, it's what drew me to this because when I saw it, I was like, I don't like that phrase. And then I, I thought, what is it that really we're talking about when we look at a new normal? Well, what we're talking about is as believers in Jesus Christ, and if you're, if you're new to faith or maybe you're, you're still kind of debating about whether this is the direction that you want to go, and you're just kind of checking these things out. You know, that's what I love about the way in which uh, many services have moved online because it's so easy to invite someone uh, to church to kind of see what it is uh, when we're talking about Jesus Christ and the saving relationship with him. And, and as it, maybe you're figuring that out, you're trying to figure that out, that the, what we find is that as you read scripture, that Christ has done something. That he, he's, he's set us free. That this, this, this sin that so easily entangles, that he's broken the bonds and he's allowed us to have life and life abundantly. And that as we live a life in Jesus Christ, that it should be different than the life in which we once lived. In fact, it should be a new normal for us. And so when I, when I really begin to understand that phrase, I leaned into that, that uh, title a little bit more. A new normal, not about mask or no mask, or not about you know, booths or tables or you know, six feet, none of that, right? What we're talking about is how are we to live as believers? What was our old life? And what is the life that God is calling us to? Well, last week, if you weren't with us last week, you can find this sermon online. But last week, we looked at this new normal in the way in which we respond to anger. And what we find is all of us get angry, right? And, and, and that was a, you know admission that we all had together. We've all gotten angry. But how do you respond to anger as a believer in Jesus Christ? Now, I told you last week, this, that was a struggle for me. It's something I, I wrestle with at times. And, and now that our kids are in service, now my kids are keeping me accountable for all of my sermons, which is a you, not it's a new thing in our, in our family here. And, and because usually they would go to children's church, they didn't know what dad preached. And so, so during the week, they didn't know that if I got angry, dad, you're breaking the whole sermon deal. You know, and, and so, so now, like this, we've been kind of meeting together, and, we, and it's, it's been fun as we've been meeting together. I'll hear them say things, and I'm like, that's from my sermon. Like, there's, you know, there's you know, kind of chastising me uh, when I get angry and uh, saying, Dad, hey, you need to control that. You can control it. That's what you said in your sermon. And, and so we, we learned that. How do you control it? How do you deal with it? How do you, all of those things. And if that's you, I encourage you to go back and to listen. But as we dive into today, I want us to really look at this whole idea of sin because it's what Christ paid the penalty for on the cross. And it's something that he set us free from. This, this, this control that sin has on our life. And before Jesus Christ enters into our life, that, that we are bound by sin because we are born sinful, but, but we have the opportunity through the sacrifice of Jesus to find freedom, not just life eternally in heaven with him, but freedom from sin that so easily entangles us here on this earth. And so I want you to turn with me, if you would, to our scripture for this series, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. I'm going to read about this whole idea of the rules for holy living, right? This, this life that, that the Apostle Paul is calling the church to as believers in Jesus Christ. These are new Christians who are just asking the question, okay, I've gotten saved, now what? What do I do with that? And, and, and Paul is writing letters to address these issues, and he says, look, you used to live a certain way, and now you are to live a different way. And what is that different way in which we are supposed to live? He begins to lay it out for us in the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and following. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So, so Paul says, look, you, you, your hearts, all those, the emotional uh, side of you, we need to set that on things above where Christ is and also our mind, that the, whole I the idea of the things that you think about, the things that you, you kind of develop in your mind. You need to set your mind on things above, your heart and your mind. They don't need to be the things of this earth, but they need to be set above. He goes on to say in verse 3, For you died, 
and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. He says you died. That when, you, when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, when you followed him in baptism, that, that you died to your old self and you were risen again, just as Christ was risen again. And that now you're made alive in Jesus Christ. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then just so that we're clear on what that is, he begins to dive into these things. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. He says in verse 7, You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now it's a new normal. Paul doesn't say that. That's just, this is my paraphrase, right? That there should be something different about you. And it shouldn't be just a passing thing. It shouldn't be when we, just, when we gather together as the church that all of a sudden now we, we abhor these things. But when we go home, we just kind of you know, dive into them once again because you know, we just kind of learn to live how we are in church world and how we are in the real world. And Paul says, no, 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 it's not the life that I'm calling you to, a life of putting on the church mask and then taking it off the rest of the week. I'm calling you to put to death these things. Now that's very intense statement, right? He doesn't say, I'm calling you to deal with these things. He doesn't say, I'm calling you to talk about these things. He says, I'm calling you to put these things to death. In fact, I believe that as we read scripture, it's very, very clear that God is calling you to something different. That when you give your life to Jesus Christ, there's a different life that he has for you. And it's a, a life that, that he, you know, he can share all of the things that, that come along with it. Life and life abundant. We're not really quite sure what that means. But it's far better than the life in which you once lived. Right? I mean, if you could just imagine your life set free from the sin that so easily kind of sways your decisions. If you've ever found yourself where, where there was sin in your life and it, and, it, and it led your life down a certain path and it's almost as though you had no control over it. Even though you knew you shouldn't be doing what you were doing, you found yourself doing it anyway. Have you ever felt that way? Paul says, I want you to put those things to death. And he's going to begin to show us how. And we're going to see through the words of Jesus today that Jesus has this powerful thing available to us that can begin to actually put these things to death. Not just storm away, but to truly get rid of them. If you've ever cleaned your closet, uh, I don't know if you go through this, you, typically you clean your closet in stages, right? I mean, you, you begin to take out your closet and you think, I'm going to get this thing organized. And, uh, and so you pull out everything and then you realize, I've got to do something now because now my room's a mess, right? And so, so I've, you know, you, you kind of started the process. You pulled everything out, and, and then you begin to kind of categorize things. Okay, these are things that I wear. These are the things that I use. These are the things that I never use, and these are the things that I, I haven't used in 10 years, but there may be a, a reason why I need these things. And they, they kind of begin to fall into these categories. And so then we, we put everything back that we use, and then we kind of box up everything that we really don't use but that we could use, and we, we store those someplace, right? And then we throw out, and we we put in garbage bags and we, we put, give out away the things that we don't use any longer. And, and what we'll find is that typically, and I'm not, maybe this is just me, but typically the things that we put away, we should have just gotten rid of because all they did was take up space in our life, right? And because we weren't ever going to use those things, we were never going to use those things, but we kind of convinced ourselves that we should maybe keep those things around. I believe after being in ministry for many, many years, after being a Christian for many, many years, I believe oftentimes as believers in Jesus Christ, we can treat sin the same way. There's certain sins that we see in our life that we think, I'm a Christian now, I don't need that any longer, I need to get rid of that. And we kick that to the curb very quickly in our Christian faith. And then there's other things that, that we look at in our life and we say, well, it's really not that bad. And it's kind of my way of dealing with certain, you know, circumstances in my life. And so I'm not going to get rid of it. I'm just going to put it away. I'm going to organize it. I'm going to make it look better in my life. But the truth is, the Apostle Paul hasn't called us to organize. He's called us to put to death those sins. Well, how do you put it to death? What is the difference that God is calling you Two, uh, this past weekend, 
Elijah and I find ourselves, we were needing to kill some time, and so he said, hey, let's go into Ross. And if you don't know what Ross is, it's a clothing store where uh, I don't know what the organizational method is, but I don't think they do either, right? They just put everything on the shelves, on the things, on the, and you never know, is this men's, women's, what, where am I at, you know? And, uh, you know, so we, we found ourselves in Ross, and we walked to the shoe store, and or the shoe section of Ross, and, and just to be quite honest, I, I like this section, right? I love Ross, you know, because I don't mind searching through if I can find a good deal. Anyone love a good deal? I love good deals, right? And so, so we're walking through, and I hear Elijah kind of give an audible <gasps> behind me and I'm like what in the world I mean, what what at Ross causes you to go <gasps> you know you know, get, you know <laughs> vapors I got the vapor you know like what causes you to do that he didn't say that by the way but you know you know and so this is what I saw him gasping about was this shoe and he's like dad look I was like yeah I saw that shoe last week when I was in here like I mean you know honestly Elijah that's kind of a chunky monkey shoe it's like you know that's like, what do you use that shoe for? The sole is so thick, and it's like, you know, just kind of looks weird, and the color is okay, but, but, you know, I just, like, I didn't understand his enthusiasm. He said, Dad, that's over a $200 shoe. I'm like, no way that is over a $200 shoe. There is no way that anyone in their right mind would pay for a $200 shoe. Like, why would you ever, like, look at that and then say, that's the shoe I want. Like, why would you ever do that? He said, no, 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 Dad, you do not understand, and he dives into the story. And he says, there's these marathon runners. And, and this shoe, they made Nike make it to the public because it was giving them an unfair advantage. I'm like, no way. I'm like, leaning in. Well, what? You know? And he's like, yeah, yeah. There's a carbon fiber plate in the shoe. It gives you two inches. Every time you, you excel, it gives you two more inches every step. And I'm like, hold up. You know, I grew up in the Reebok pump era. I know, you know, sometimes they say things that are not true. Like, like you, I thought if I got the pump, I could dunk. I'm 5'6". It was never going to happen, right? And so, but I said, you know, hold up. He said, no, no, just hear me out. There's a titanium plate. And he begins to explain everything about the shoe. And when he got done, I was like, we got to buy the shoe. <laughs> you know, I mean, you just be, I didn't understand the value that was there. I didn't understand what it was that was being made available. All I could see was that no one wears these things, and I don't want to look like an idiot. And I look at our Christian folk. I look at our Christian faith. I, I look at this whole idea when people say, I've come to know Jesus Christ. I'm going to live my life for Christian, uh, you know, Christian values. I'm going to live my life for Jesus. And, and oftentimes, I think others on the outside look at it and go, why would you do that? I mean, I mean, I look at what you guys do and the, the holiness that you try to, to, to bring your life by, and it, it just looks clunky and awkward. And I mean, I just think like life would be easier. It would be more attractive. It would be much better. I mean, why would you choose this? And they do not understand the value of what is being presented. And then I put it on. Oh, my goodness. Like, I, I didn't understand a shoe could be so comfortable. Like, I'm, like, in the house, and I felt like a kid. You know when you're a kid, and you got new, new shoes, and you're like, hey, Dad, watch me, and you, I'm going to run faster? And, like, you ran down the hallway, and you ran back, and you're like, you were, you were guaranteed you were running faster. I was guaranteed. Like, I'm going to run faster in these shoes. I was just so, you know, enamored by them once I put them on. And I think once we begin to understand... I'm not going to put that on the community table. Once we begin to understand, my dad would find me somewhere and hit me, right? I, I'm, once we understand the quality that has been given to us, what has been put into uh, the, the uh, life that Jesus Christ has made available to us, and once we begin to walk in it, we would never go back. That's what I told Elijah. I'm like, son, you've ruined me, Right? Like, now you've made me like, I don't want anything less than $200 shoes, and I'm not going to always find them for $49.99, right? I'm just, you know, but, but once we've experienced it, there's no way that we would go back, but until we've experienced it, we just don't know if that would really fit our life. And I believe that God is calling us to something different, and although it may look strange to you, and although it may seem strange to you, and although the, the things that we talk about, I mean, you know, to, to look at the Scripture and to say, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality. Sexual immorality? Are you serious? Like, it's, it's 2020. Like, why would I put that away? That's just a, a way of life. And Jesus says, no, 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 trust me. This is far greater for your life. There, there's a power that comes into your life. There's a satisfaction, a joy that comes into your life when those things are only uh, made in the, the marriage sacred covenant, right? There's a, there's a, a joy that can come through that. When I look at impurity and lust, evil desires and greed, come on, I mean, doesn't that just define who we are? 
I mean, why would I give those things up? And Jesus says, no, I've, I've created you for something different, something better, far greater than you could ever experience. And as soon as we begin to walk in it, we would never want to go back to the things that have now been available to us. As we look at the life of Jesus, in Luke 17, Jesus is walking with his disciples and he shares with them something I really think applies to the words of Paul today. Because oftentimes as believers in Jesus Christ, the, the, the fact is, is that, that we, we desire to do what the Bible tells us to do. One, either we don't know what it says because we haven't read it. Or two, we just don't believe that it, it really is better than the life in which we are currently living. And as we look at Luke chapter 17, as you're turning there, I'm reminded of the quote by John Owen, a, Pur a Puritan in the 1800s. He said, The vigor and power and comfort of our spiritual life depends on our mortification of deeds of the flesh. The vigor and power and comfort of our spiritual life depends on our mortification of the deeds of the flesh. It's, it's as though the things that God has in store for us, they truly begin to come into play when we truly do kill that which Paul is calling us to kill. But, but John also goes on and he says this, John Owens, he says, look, but once you hit the snake, you be, re be ready to kill the snake. <laughs> Otherwise, it could come back to bite you. And I thought, man, that is such a profound statement. Because how many times in our life do we dabble with putting away sin, but we never truly go after it? We never say, you know what, I, this, I'm done following victim to sin. I'm done having it bite me time and time and time again. I'm done having it affect my relationships. I'm done having it affect my, my family. I'm done having it. I see it in my children, in my children's children. I'm just time to be done with it. And instead of just hitting the snake, we decide I'm going to put this thing to death. John says that's the attitude that we need to have when we're going after these things. And so if you're ready to put this to death, if you're truly tired of sin kind of hanging around your life, I believe the words of Jesus have something to say to you this morning. John, or Luke 17, verse 1, Jesus said his, to his disciples, the things that cause people to stumble or to fall into temptation are bound to come. Why right, can we just stop there? Because I think sometimes we get surprised when temptation enters into our life. Jesus said to his disciples, these things, these things that cause people to stumble, these things that cause people to be tempted, they're bound to come into your life. Why are they bound to come? Because you live in a fallen world, a sinful world. He goes on to say, but woe to anyone through whom they come. And all of a sudden we're going to realize how serious Jesus is when it comes to the things in which Paul is speaking of. He says, it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea by a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Jesus. <laughs> it would be better for them. Those who lead others into them, this temptation, those who lead others to sin, it would be better for, to, for them to have a millstone tied around their neck and to be thrown into the sea than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. He says in verse 3, So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. I mean, if you remember, this isn't the only time Jesus talks to his disciples about forgiveness. In fact, there was that time when Peter came to Jesus and said, Hey, hey, when we're forgiving people, how many times should we forgive them? Seven times? Like, that sounds like a really reasonable number. <laughs> And Jesus says, no, not seven, but 70 times seven. That as long as they're repentant, you are to be forgiving. The apostles' response to this is something I think that we can easily miss. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> Jesus, we, we, we've just heard what you've called us to do in forgiving others when they wrong us. And we've, called, we've heard how you've called us to live in, in avoiding not only sin, but, a, but avoiding leading others into temptation. And the response is, Lord, you're going to have to increase our faith for that to come true in our life. How many, how many times have you felt that way in your relationship with the Lord? God, if, if I'm going to live this way, you're going to have to come through big time. Because I know me. 
I, I, I know what I'm, I, I typically do. I know the way I typically respond to things. I know where my weaknesses are, God. And, to, and I hear what you're saying, but Lord, I'm going to need you to increase my faith because I don't know if I can do the things that which you're calling me to do. And Jesus says very, something very interesting about this. He replies, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the seas, and it will obey you. Now, I don't know about you. If I'm sitting there with Jesus, I'm thinking, I'm sorry, maybe I misunderstood. I'm not talking about planting and unplanting trees. What I'm talking about is forgiving people and living this life you know, of, of putting to death sin. Right, that's what I'm talking about. Jesus says, no, 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 I understand. But, but if you have faith even the size of a mustard seed, I want you to hear what you can do. Now, I had a friend just the last couple of weeks, he was talking to me at the gym, and we were talking about this passage, and he said, you know what's something I never realized about that passage? And I said, what? He said, what I never realized is that, that oftentimes we talk about the tree being uprooted and the mountain being moved, you know, these two very uh, miraculous things that Jesus says we're going to be able to do. He says we talk about those things and we relate them to faith and we, we relate them to miracles, right? Like if you're praying for someone, you've got to have faith and the faith that can be a miracle and you can even move mountains and up, uh, uproot trees. And he said, we kind of re relegated to that. He said, but really, if you look at that, what, is Jesus, what was the thing he was just talking about? He was talking about forgiving others when they've wronged you. And he says, what's harder than to forgive someone when they've wronged you and you just don't want to do it any longer? And Jesus says, if you just have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can even do those things. And he said, and John, you know what the mulberry tree is, right? And, and, I, and I tried to nod along and then I was just like, no, I don't, I don't. You know, tell me, right? He says, the mulberry tree in the Old Testament, it was a tree that it could live up to 600 years. And its root system, because of the climate, really went down deep. And so Jesus could have picked any tree. He picked this tree that was, was, was known for its age and was known for its deep roots. And he says, look, even if you have a small amount of faith, you can rip that thing out. What I think is so amazing about that thought is not only the fact that when we talk about sinful behavior in our life, because come on, let's be honest, some of that sinful behavior, it hasn't been around for a year or two. It's been around for years, for decades. It hasn't just been around for your generation. It was something that you saw your dad do and your grandfather do. I mean, for multiple generations, it's been around. And so the overwhelming thought, and I believe what the enemy tries to whisper into our life is that, who are you to think that you can eradicate that which your dad and your grandfather and your great-grandfather that they couldn't do? You think you're going to be the one to get rid of this in your life. How arrogant are you? And yet we hear the words of Jesus, even if you have a mustard seed of faith, you can tell that tree, be uprooted and be planted in the ocean. You can eradicate that which has been there for years and the roots that have grown so deep in your family. It seems as though they're always going to be there if you only have faith. And here's what I love about that promise is that it's not the size of your faith, it's the application of it. You see, often, you know, we're just, Lord, increase our faith, increase our faith. Jesus says, look, you've got all of the faith you need right now to do what I'm calling you to do. I just need you to act in it. In fact, I love what one commentator said. He said, do not fret about how great your faith is. Only apply what you have and watch it work. <laughs> If you'll just start applying faith to every little situation and watching it work, what is it going to do? One, it's going to eradicate the things that are in your life. But two, as you watch these things unfold in your life, your faith is going to naturally increase. Why? Because when we step out and God is there, we're so much bolder on the next step. And I believe God is calling us to be different. I believe he's called the church for centuries to have a new normal about their life. And I think one of the greatest uh, grievances we can do as believers in Jesus Christ, one of the ways in which we grieve the Holy Spirit is when we claim to have a relationship with Jesus and yet our life does not line up with the Word of God. What is God calling you to do? Who is He calling you to be? What sin is He calling you to put away, to put to death in your life? So I just don't know if I can do it. Do you believe that Jesus is who He says He is? Do you believe he can do great and mighty things? You know, the word says with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. 
What that shows me is that there's no, even if we sat down together one-on-one and you begin to list out everything that was in your life, there would never be a point where I would say, you're right, I don't think God can handle that. You? Probably not. God in you? Most definitely. Yeah, I believe our world needs to see believers, especially in moments like these, who are living different. Those who walk with a faithfulness, those who walk with a boldness, those who understand what's been made available to them, even if it may look strange to other people. You see what I found amazing about this story? As I looked it up, Elijah was right. This was version one. There's now a new version. And runners who did not have a contract with Nike, they're putting on Nike shoes, blocking them out so no one can tell the brand and running the race. Why? Because they've realized that those who wear these shoes have a greater advantage in the race. It's changing the running world. See, I believe that we have Christians who are claiming to own the shoes, but who are wearing what they've always worn, and they're running the race in the way in which they've always run the race, and those who are beside them are looking at their life going, look, your life's no different than mine. (laughs) You struggle with the same things I struggle with. You don't have victory. I mean, I almost don't have more problems. You have more problems than me, right? Why would I live that way? And I believe God is calling us to a new normal. I believe he's calling us to truly put faith into that which we say we believe and to run with, with endurance the race marked out before us. And I believe when we really put faith in what we say we believe and we trust God in these matters. And come on, let's, let's be honest, it gets hard at times, does it not? Because these things are deeply rooted in our life. These things have been there for years. And, but when we truly put our faith in action and we say, God, look, I need you every hour. I need you. God, would you show me the way in which I'm supposed to live? Lord, would you give me victory over this temptation? Would you allow me? Scripture says there is no temptation that's been given to you that God has not given you a way out. Every single one. Every one that you and I have both fallen in. And we've ended up on the other side saying, why did I do that? Once again, I mean, you're coming to God once again. How many times have you come to God in prayer and said, Lord, forgive me for something that you've asked forgiveness for, forgiveness for, forgiveness for? Some of you have found yourself in that moment and you think, I don't think God's listening to me anymore. Well, why would not God do what he told his disciples to do, that when we're truly repentant, He says, I don't care how many times they come back. You forgive. And so this morning, if your heart is broken at the place in which you found yourself, know that you can find a right relationship with God by just coming before him and repenting and saying, God, forgive me for my sin. And this morning, as we're walking this life in Jesus Christ, know that as we face these things, God has given you the power to overcome them. You say, okay, but once we cut these things out, like what am I supposed to do? What are the methods of which I'm supposed to do? If that's your question, I want to invite you back next week. As we conclude this series, the Apostle Paul not only tells us what to, we're up to abstain from, he says we're, what we're supposed to gravitate towards, what we're supposed to take away from our life, and what we're supposed to be adding to our life. And what we find is that there's an amazing thing that happens when we not only take away, but when we add to that all of a sudden we find more victory in the things of God. This morning I want to pray for you because I don't know about you, the last few months have been very, very difficult. Emotionally, you know, you know the, uh, we were hearing stats the other day. My brother-in-law was sharing stats. He's, you know, divorce is up, depression is up. I mean, all of these different stats that are come available. And, and as you've been living it, just like we've been living it, you would go, yeah, that doesn't surprise me, does it? I mean, I was, I was talking to my friend who's a, um, a uh, sheriff in Arizona, and, and we were talking last week even about um, the trafficking things that were taking place. He said, John, you don't understand what's, what's actually happening. And, uh, and he said how it's risen since the corona because, because people are just at home and they're, they're bored and, you know, the idle hands thing. And he said, it's just, it's just crazy what's, what's taking place right now. And my heart breaks for that. And so I get it. I understand that right now as we're talking about these things, you may be in your heart, your spirit, you're saying, look, I want to believe that, but, but man, I'm just struggling right now. 
I, mean, I just seem angry all the time. I, I just seem depressed all the time. I just seem like, is there ever going to be an end to this? It just, I mean, I just really find myself lost in this moment. And if that's you, I want you to find victory this morning in one name and one name alone, and that's Jesus. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He has not left you in the midst of this. He's been right beside you. And I believe what's going to be an amazing testimony of the church is how we run the race during this time. And that includes you and it includes me. Paul says, put to death these things that belong to the earthly nature. That should be our new normal. Won't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for a moment, God, to just sit and rest <laughs> with no social media, no news. God, just your word. And Lord, today, I pray that you would remind folks of who you've called them to be in Christ. And that you would help us to understand it's not just for those with great faith, but Lord, even the smallest faith can be, begin to do that which we thought was impossible in our life. And there may be those either here with us or online this morning. Lord, that as we were talking about that tree, that deeply rooted tree, there was a sin, there was a, a, a life that, that began to come to mind. And Lord, I pray today that through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, that you would speak directly to each and every individual who's really at that crossroads saying, can God really do this in my life? I want to believe. Lord, help my unbelief. God, that you would give them the strength to take that step of faith. Give them the strength to open up their hearts to you, to lay down their pride and to say, God, I need you. Would you come into my life? Would you make possible that which I thought was impossible? Would you remove these things so that I can truly experience what life is like when I'm not bound by chains of sin? Lord, let us be those that today we stop poking at the snake. Lord, we kill it in our life. Lord, we decide that we're done having these things within us, but God, that we're going to be through with lesser things. Lord God, though just as the Apostle Paul has said, we're going to put to death those things that belong to the earthly nature. And Lord, I know for many of us that's going to be a process as we continue to walk this and you reveal things to us through the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you for loving us so much that you're always making us more like you. But God, as you reveal these things, remind us of the truth of your word. As we feel as though we don't have strength and we listen to the lies of the enemy, let your voice come through loud and clear. What's impossible with men is possible with me. God, would you move today? We desire to see you move, not just in this place, but in this community, this state, this nation, this world, as we face a pandemic. Lord, as children of God, it should be different than in the way anyone else faces it because we have a power available to us. So Lord, wake us up. Set us free. Remind us of who we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, won't you stand with me this morning? If you want to respond today, if you're online with us, there's a, a prayer button. If you would like someone to pray with you, just know you can click that and someone would be there in the chat available to pray with you. If you're here in the congregation today, as we sing this song, let it be a, an anthem for you. But if you need to pray, I just invite you just to kneel at your seat and pray and ask God to move. And if you have things in your life that you just really need to talk with someone about, you need someone to just pray over you about, to remind you and to just listen to what the word of God says to your situation. I, after service, I want you to be free to come down. I would love to talk with you. I love you. And I'm excited to see the race that's set before you. Let's sing. Amen. <clears throat> you know, as I was bringing this to church today, I, I thought, you know, someone put this on a shelf. And they put a price tag on it, and they just left it up there. And as people would come in, they, they determined the value by what the price tag said. Had the person really known the value of that shoe, I really doubt they would have put it for that low, but they just arbitrarily put a price, probably by the way in which they viewed it. And I think many people are living life arbitrarily by 
the price that someone has else put, on, put upon them. They've been told who they are. They've been told what they're good at. They've been told what they're not good at. They've been told what they'll be able to accomplish in life and what they'll not be able to accomplish. Not because the person truly knows them, but just because of the price that's been put upon them. But if they truly knew how they had been created, if they truly knew the one who had created them, if they truly knew the way that which he had knit them together in their mother's womb, they would realize they are far more valuable than that price that has put up on their life. This morning, I just want you to know how much God loves you and how valuable you are in his kingdom. He's given his son for you. The ultimate sacrifice. So I don't care what anyone else says. I want you to believe the one who created you, amen? He's got something different. He's got a new normal, and I want you to experience it. Join back with us this next week. I, I want to invite you back as we conclude our series this coming Sunday. Can we give a hand to the Union Hill team? So thankful to have them with us this morning. Thankful for Wayne for putting that together for us today, but it's been a great to be able to gather together, to worship together with one another. Let me pray for you as we leave. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for who you are and who you've created us to be, for the power that you've made available for us to conquer sin. And Lord, today as we leave this place, there may still be those who are doubting the possibility of that statement. Lord, I would pray that you would take the small faith that they have and that you would begin to show them how mighty you truly are as they put their hands or their life in your hands. God, what you can truly do with that individual. Lord, let us experience life and life abundantly so that as we interact with others, and as others ask us where the joy, where the peace, where the love comes from, we can point them to the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. We can point them to Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this moment. We ask that as we leave, you will continue to challenge us through the Holy Spirit. And Lord, just as you did last week, that you will show us that there is a new normal that awaits. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great day.